I need to encourage us to please try all possible best to do the best you can for your exams. I can bet you July sitting will be very, very interesting and um, the pass rate will likely be high. Usually we meet to solve questions on Tuesdays. However, the current situation has called for us to prioritize concluding with the syllabus, then all we need to do is solve. And the reason I've decided to take this particular approach is because as we solve questions, we may likely be seeing that um, part of the areas we have not studied or treated in class may be tested in the, in the past questions. So I think it's proper for us to just conclude the syllabus, then all subsequent meetings will be to solve as much questions as we can. However, please make sure that you are practicing as much as you can. Take your revision kit, open it, attempt those questions, but um, also make sure that if you have any challenges, you reach out to me. That way, I can assure you that you will pass this course. There is no two ways. Practice, attend lectures, seek clarification where you need. Okay. So, um, where did we stop on Saturday? I would like to share my screen um, so that we can continue fast. Uh, actually, something came up in the office for a meeting for 4.30, but I have, um, since I have this commitment already, I decided not to join that particular meeting. So it's not like conflict of interest, but is is a meeting I can decide to to be part of or not. So I take this class very seriously and I hope um, you guys too will reciprocate by putting in your best and achieving a pass come July. Yes, so the, the topic we were treating before today was review and finalization. For those that have been in class, you realize that what I mentioned was that during review and finalization, this is the opportunity for the auditors to have a final review and finalize on all their conclusions. Final review, reviewing things like going concern, reviewing um, all the written representations they've collected, reviewing subsequent events, reviewing related party transactions, reviewing, um, carrying out an overall review. Um, you also review aggregate uncorrected misstatements and things like that. I mentioned just as an overview that this is usually done by the engagement partner. The engagement partner is highly experienced. He knows what to look out for. He may have been involved in the audit of the same client in the past. Um, so it will be easy for him to spot any unusual transactions or unusual, um, or, or unusual conclusions by even his audit team. I would not want to take much of our time because um, after this topic, we'll be going to audit report and that particular topic is very, very important. It will be tested. It will be tested. We cannot escape it. Okay. Um, so, written representation. Um, before we continue, I need to ask whoever is confident enough because SEC exam requires a lot of confidence. If you are confident enough, can you please tell me which are, where are those specific areas that requires the auditor to ask the management to present written representation, especially during this uh, review and finalization? We discussed it over the weekend. Where are those areas that management would be required to provide written representation to the auditors? or the auditors will be required to request for written representation. So anyone you remember, please let me hear. And for those that have been reading their notes, you can also attempt, but um, I would be expecting um, students that were in class over the weekend to be able to just give me one or two of these. So I'm listening. 
where are the areas that the auditor is required by ISA 580 to request for written representation? I think two or three people should build the cards. Yes, Ujima. You want to try? Okay, if you can try, someone else should try. Yeah, um, written representation is, yeah. and the auditor may require for written, uh, written representations in a situation where one, according to, to what you told us yesterday, is that written representation is like a secondary evidence. Yes, secondary form of evidence, yes. A form of evidence to support a situation where things are not so clear. Yes, like he's not maybe, satisfied and he has not gathered sufficient evidence, yes. It's like in the situation of the going concern of of the company, of the entity. So okay. when certain documents are, are are presented to the auditor, and the auditor is being skeptic, okay, uh, about the about the the report. Okay, so, and there's no any better way to we, to ascertain it. Thank so you. The, so yes. the auditor may, in that situation, request for a written representation. Yes, that's, that's, that's a very good attempt. Um, so from what I get now, they, we request written representation for, for the use of the going concern assumption for management. Okay, so that I don't um, drag us too much. If you recall, I also mentioned that issue of related party transactions uh, the, the the management will also issue a written representation stating that all related party transactions have been identified and disclosed in line with the accounting standard issue of subsequent events that written representation that all subsequent events have been identified by management and be properly treated and disclosed where they need to so um Thank you for that. Um, so I encourage us to read our notes. Um, other areas where you need written representation, as I said, related parties, um, that all uncorrected misstatements remain immaterial, that the entities are going concern as a reporting date, that the entities are going concern as a reporting date, um, that all subsequent events have been identified, that all the accounting policies stated and applied were appropriate for the organization. Okay, so thank you, AY, for your attempt. So we'll conclude, we'll, con we'll, we'll proceed. Um, so we stopped at overall review of the financial statement. So when we talk of overall review of the financial statement in line with I ISA 220, the auditor is required, that's the engagement partner, as I mentioned earlier, is required to take a look, take that final review of all the conclusions made by members of the audit team, all documentations that have been supported. For each conclusion, it needs to be sure that those conclusions have been properly documented and supported with appropriate evidence. So when we talk of this overall review, it's just like you starting your car in the, in the morning and you are supposed to embark on a journey. And what you need to do, you check your tires, you check your engine oil, you check your, you know, just that overall review must be done by someone. And who I said is responsible for that is the engagement partner or any other senior member of the audit team. So not really engagement partner per se, but you can imagine if the engagement partner is not available, a senior member of the audit team must perform this overall review. Senior 
member means that he has experience, is knowledgeable, and you know he has all the requirements of a, a, a leader that can actually review the work you know, many years of experience and things like that. So when you talk of overall review, it is usually done with um, analytical procedures. You would remember that we mentioned when we discussed analytical procedures, we said analytical procedures are used in three, um, three stages of the audit. At the risk and assessment stage, when you're assessing the risk of material misstatement, during substantive analytic, substantive stage, you do a substantive analytical review um, procedure, then at the um, review and finalization stage. Are your hands are up? Let me hear him. Yes, you have a question? Yes, I have. Okay. No, I've seen uh, situations okay. or uh, instances where they mention things like uh, engagement partner or partner, in a, maybe to an audit team or in an audit team. Yes. So I, I want clarification about that, uh, the use of that particular term. Like, I, like now you said, a senior member of the audit team. I understand that. Yes. An engagement partner, is it that maybe there are two, uh, two audit firms? You okay. know, involved in that audit, uh, audit. Okay. Uh, job or something. So I okay. don't really understand. What... Okay, so this is how it works. In an audit firm, an audit firm is likely going to have series of engagements, multiple engagements at the same time. But there will be a partner that is responsible for individual audits. Or even this engagement partner may be responsible for two or three audits in the same audit firm. So is a partner, but is that particular audit is under his purview. He's not going to um, be on the field with them. In fact, there are senior members of the audit firm that will usually go for something like an entrance meeting where they'll meet with management, tell management why they are there, their scope, why they need to perform this and seek for um, what we call support or cooperation. The engagement partner may not be on that assignment. But you are likely to have audit seniors, you know, audit seniors, audit managers on that audit. Those will be the ones on the field. But an engagement partner will usually be in the office, but is responsible for the audit. Um, for instance, if um, the Nigerian army has a battle in Taraba, they have a battle in um, Bronu, they have a battle in Katsina. I'm assuming all these areas are, are not east or something like that. There will be a general uh, officer commanding that whole area who is responsible for all those battles. But for those battles, he will not be on the field. He will definitely send commanders to command or uh, platoon commanders or brigade commanders that would now be um, in charge of individual battles. So at the end of each of those battles now, or before he gives a final report to probably the commander in chief, telling the commander in chief, we've concluded this battle, this is the result of our battle, those um, brigade commanders or GOCs will report back, um, brigade commanders will report to the GOC and the GOC reports now to either the CNC. So in this kind of example I've given you now, the audit engagement partner is like the general officer commanding. And in his area of purview, he may have more than two or three audits going on at the same time. And those audits he has going on would be manned by either a senior auditor or audit manager or whatever the designation is for that um, audit. So for, for, he's responsible for issuing the report. He's responsible for reviewing the work that has been done by all those teams. But he may likely not be on that engagement with them. And because of his experience, he understands those clients so much or the industry so much that as long as they, as soon as they finish what they are doing on the field, he takes all the reports, all the documents, 
and it performs that overall review. And that overall review now means that it's looking at documentations, it's looking at, it's performing analytical procedures to, to give him an understanding whether what he knows, his knowledge of this entity is consistent with the report that is generated or that is about to be signed. So it's like that last line of defense to carry out this review. Um, they're supposed to receive written representation for eight areas or nine specific areas. He wants to find out whether they are all complete. They're supposed to be sure that um, all um, subsequent events have been identified and treated. He needs to be sure that there's documents showing that all subsequent reviews have been identified and treated and also supported with a written representation from those that were on the field. So at the end of the day, um, is responsible for the audit. It may likely not mean that he's on the field with them, but he's in charge of that audit. Is the is the big man behind is the big man behind the masquerade, so to say, that sits down, looks at what every member has done, and he kinds of co 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 uh, what we call collates all opinions, all conclusions in all the areas of the audit and see whether what they have concluded based on documents and evidence gathered are consistent with his own understanding based on his experience. Um, let me know if you actually got me right. Yes, I got it. Okay, so um, any other question? Okay, so we... We go on. Um, welcome, Asana. Yes. So we are saying that this engagement partner will usually be using analytical procedures. And we said analytical procedures is um, the comparison or analyzing financial and non financial information in a way that it, 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 um, we, it gives us any variances and we try to investigate what those variances are and why those variances are there. So with analytical procedure, let me give you an example. Before he signs this final um, report, he may want to carry out, um, he may want to perform these two or three ratios, maybe a quick ratio, acetate ratio, or um, what's this other ratio? Maybe gearing ratio. And when he sees the ratio, when he gets the result of this analytical procedure, he's going to compare it with his own understanding of that entity. For example, if you get um, one over two, that's um, the, the, the assets are able to cover the liability by two times, you know, two times um, during the year. Then the, the, his main understanding of the entity is that these people are in real serious financial crisis. They have a lot of debt and they cannot cover their assets. So what you now do is to ask questions. Why is this financial statement giving me this kind of results when my understanding is that these people are in distress? My understanding is that they cannot even pay or sort out all their liabilities. So why is, my, why is this result giving us this. So that is how the, uh, the engagement partner uses, um, uses analytical procedures when um, carrying out his uh, audit. Please give me a second. Let me just mute you. Okay, sorry for that. Um, so that is, that is an example of how analytical procedures are used by the engagement partner. So when performing this, um, this last conclusion or drawing conclusion on all the areas before giving his opinion, yes, the auditor takes into consideration all conclusions drawn from various areas of the audit before giving final opinion on the financial statement. So he looks at assets. 
it looks at liabilities, it looks at revenue, it looks like at um, um, cost of sales, looks at tax, looks at administrative, all those areas that the other audit members have worked on, it needs to carry out that final review to be sure that whatever conclusion they came, they, they came to in those areas are, are reasonable. They are consistent with their understanding or even with the risk that they've assessed at the beginning. So um, the, the, the auditor should take steps to consider and determine the following. One, whether the financial statement, as I've mentioned earlier, is consistent with his knowledge of the client's business and industry. This is what you do. This is what I know of your industry. Whatever they are preparing to give him at that last stage where he's reviewing, it must be consistent with his previous knowledge. He needs to also consider whether information on the financial statement is in accordance with laws and regulation. Laws and regulation means that issue of compliance. What does the law say? What does the generally accepted accounting principle in that jurisdiction say? So it must be sure. For instance, um, you might have uh, maybe if it's a bank now, maybe Bofia, you have um, uh, NDIC, CBN. It needs to be sure that this financial statement has been prepared in line with all those local laws and regulations. It must also know whether it reflects the substance of the underlying transactions and not merely its legal form. What we mean by this is that by looking at just figures or looking at those legal, um, legal binding requirements of transactions, this may not actually be, it may not actually reflect substance. For uh, one instance is um, Liz. We said that, uh, can somebody give me the definition of assets? What's the definition of assets? Yes, I'm listening. Definition of assets. Um, okay. Hey, hey, can I talk? Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, they present uh, economic results controlled. Yes. By the entity. By the by, yes, by the entity. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so as a as a result of past events. Yes. And, you have not completed uh, and, uh, which which yes. So. And um, which economic benefit? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, what happens to the economic to, benefit? The economic benefit is expected to flow into the organization. Flow into the business. Okay. Flow into the business. Okay, is that Ojima? Yes. Okay. So now you can imagine when you are looking at issue of um, assets, we are talking of control. We are talking of past events. We are talking of economic benefit flowing into the entity. Now, if I have leased a vehicle, a motor vehicle, and this motor vehicle belongs to, the company belongs to Ayo Phillips, Ayo Phillips and Co. The vehicle is, it belongs to Ayo Phillips and Co. His name is on the vehicle, but I, Omomo Foods, I'm using this same vehicle to generate economic benefits. I'm using it for my operations. Now, I want to ask you, is it proper for me to put that vehicle as part of my asset, or that asset should remain the asset of Ayo Phillips? This is an open question. I think it depends on how you acquire the, the assets. If, if, it's a, if, if Ayo Phillips leads it to you, yes. then you should recognize it as an asset why because the standards according to investment property oh, sorry according to ifrs 16 16 thank you yes property plans and so, according to that so you have to recognize least assets and then yes. treat them according to how you treat it if it is a 
okay. according to how you treat IS-16. Okay, thank you. So now, the reason for treating it that way is one, I am controlling it. It is in the name of Ayo Phillips, but Omomo Foods is controlling the assets. The past transaction, that lease agreement was the past transaction. Economic benefit comes to the organization from the use of this asset. So when we talk of substance over form, if you want to look at the legal form, we will say, oh, it belongs to Ayo Phillips because Ayo Phillips' name is on the document. But really, that is not the fact. The name of Ayo Phillips is there, but I am controlling the asset. All the risk and reward that relates to that asset still lies with me. I maintain it. If anything is wrong with it, I maintain it. I service it. I make sure it's in good form. I use it to generate benefit. I can decide what to do with the vehicle. So if we were to be looking at only legal form, then that means such a vehicle or such an asset that has been leased will now not be on the financial statement, which means that that financial statement or rather asset has been understated. So I hope you understand when we talk of financial statement reflecting the substance of the underlying transaction and not merely its legal form. Do we understand that now? No. <laughs> you don't? Not really. <laughs> okay, so what I'm saying is that the vehicle belongs to Ayo Phillips. Omomo Foods is using the vehicle. The but which standard is which standard is handling that? I don't know. IS 16, uh, okay. Now, if you go to IS 1, from IS 1, you are able to see the definitions of assets and all those. If you go to IS 16, IS 16 will tell you how to actually treat um, property, plants, and equipment. If you now go to lease, lease, the standard, which has been changed from IS 7 to, um, no, which has been changed now to IFRS 17, it tells you how to treat um, leased properties. So, so when we are talking of substance over form, we are saying that don't only be looking at the legal aspect of transactions. You have to look at the substance. Okay, let me give you one other example. Let's leave assets. For instance, if um, somebody has taken my company to court, and in court, they are, they are suing me for, say, $20 million. But you know that legally, until the judge has declared that I've been found guilty and they charge me to pay that $20 million, I'm not supposed to recognize it in my um, financial statements. But when you look at the substance of the transaction, when you look at the issue of fair presentation, then we need to see how probable is it that this um, judgment will go against me? Then we need to also consider whether this um, is a prudent transaction, prudency. If it's highly likely, highly probable that this judgment will go against me, then it's better I recognize it immediately and not wait till the judge says, you are hereby found guilty. That is just to make sure that whatever the financial statement is um, reflecting is fair, is carrying the substance. And if I go back to the lease example, a lease, the asset belongs to the um, owner of the asset that has leased it to me to use. But when you look at the definition of asset, asset says that any, any item or an asset is anything that is controlled so it belongs to someone else, but I'm controlling it. It belongs to someone else, but I'm enjoying the risk and the rewards. I don't know if you get me. It belongs to someone else, but it's generating economic benefits. So not to confuse you more, Ayo, when you are talking of issue of lease, as long as you carry it on your financial statement as an asset, there will be a, a corresponding recognition of liability because I'm still going to be paying that lease payment, that monthly payment. So you're having it as assets, you're also recognizing it as liability. So that means that payment for the cost of that asset will be going out through 
the liability. So what I will encourage you is that go back to your financial reporting, take a look at it. If you still have any issues with it, then um, reach out to me. I'll be more than glad to uh, provide you with more clarification. Okay, so that we go ahead. Yes, this engagement partner must also be sure that this accounting policies used in preparing their financial statement are in line with IFRS, if that is the standard that is being um, 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 used or adopted. All accounting policies, whatever IS2 says, IS7, IS8, IS16, 38, 39, all their policies must be prepared using the um, proper or relevant financial reporting framework. Um, all disclosures should be consistent with what the policies say and the entity circumstances. For instance, um, somebody, a director is owing the entity $10. You think it's not material, but what the standard says in IS24 is that all related party transactions must be disclosed. It's a disclosure standard. So even if the management thinks that that $10 is not, is not material, but the standard says they should be disclosed. So you must make sure that all accounting, whether all accounting policies have been properly disclosed and they are consistent with um, the appropriate, with the entity's circumstance and the relevant standard. If there's any departure from the standard, it must be justified in order to give a true and fair view. So of course you are aware that in some cases, some entities might actually um, depart from what the standard says for certain reasons. Whatever those reasons are, they must be justified and they must be duly, you know, disclosed and presented for all to see. They must also make sure that um, the impact of aggregate uncorrected misstatements are identified during the audit and it does not exceed materiality level. So let me explain this. Now, you know, when we talk of audit, we usually, we're usually talking about um, materiality, materiality, materiality. You were only concerned with material misstatements. We are only concerned with material items in the financial statement. So by that statement, what we are saying is, there are likely to be certain transactions that there are likely to be certain transactions that require correction. But now, it requires correction, but we are only concerned with those that are material. There are transactions that require correction, but we are not concerned that with those that are immaterial. Only those that are material concern us. But now, we need to be very careful so that, for instance, if we say, um, our materiality level is um, $50,000. But you are likely to find other transactions, you are likely to find other transactions that are like misstatements rather. You are likely to find misstatements that are $10,000, $10, $8,000, They are not yet up to our materiality level. But we need to be very careful to ensure that when you add up all these immaterial transactions, they don't, at the end of the day, surpass the materiality level. We need to be very careful of that. Okay, now let me also rewind a bit. Once the transaction is not material, then you may not be able to press the, the, the management to correct it because they'll tell you it's not material or you yourself will identify it as not being material. So what we are saying here is that we must be sure that all, we must be sure that all uncorrected misstatements, all, all the uncorrected misstatements, all of them, that's the ones that are not corrected. We have to be sure that when you put everything together, that's when you aggregate them together, they do not surpass the materiality level they do not exceed the materiality level. Now, having said that, or let me rewind again, you have to be sure that all the misstatements that are not material and are not corrected do not surpass your materiality level. Now, what concept, I'm now asking a question, what concept allows the auditor to set a materiality level 
below the original materiality level? That's the question. What concept allows the auditor to set a materiality level that is lower than the original materiality level for the entire financial statement? We have treated that in the past. There's a concept that allows the auditor to set a materiality level at a level that is lower than the original or overall materiality level for the financial statement. Is anybody attempting that? Yes, Asana. Sir, did you hear me? I'm listening to you. No, no. I'm talking about, yes, I'm trying to say about the natural aspect of it. Okay, go ahead. Let's hear you. Nature has, if the nature has shown that the, it should be treated below, then the auditor will treat it like that. So, sorry, I've not said. Okay. Don't help me. Who has heard of the concept of performance materiality? Performance materiality. Who has heard of performance materiality? We discussed performance materiality in class. Who has heard of performance materiality? Performance yes. materiality. Yes, go ahead, Ayo. I think that's the amount less than the, maybe like a kind of a, an initially set. Uh, Materiality level that, like, I don't know, sure. but that's my attention. As in, okay. yes, an amount less than the okay. normal materiality level. Yes. Okay, so please, everybody should take note performance materiality. Um, let me hear from Abraham. Abraham, you are quiet. What's performance materiality? I'm not sure, but let me try. Yes, please try. Um, it's like a threshold that the auditor uses that the materiality level should not like exceed. Like he introduces his own materiality level. So when everything is aggregated, it doesn't exceed that level. Okay. Okay. Um, good attempt. So when we talk of performance materiality, please let us note that this is the materiality set for individual areas of the financial statement. The auditor sets a materiality level for each area of the financial statement. And that level he has set will usually be lower than the overall financial statement materiality. And the essence for setting this performance materiality is to ensure that all aggregated um, all aggregated on material on material transactions do not exceed the materiality level. So if you have 50,000 as your materiality level, you go to revenue, you can set 30 there. You go to inventory, you set 20. You go to liability tax, you set 12. You go to this area, you set this. Because if you give that overall materiality level, that means certain transactions may never be flagged as having issues. That means some other little, little, little transactions may have issues. So you go to each area of the financial statement and set a materiality level that corresponds with the kind of transactions you have there. So at the end of the day, you are able to flag certain transactions to make sure that all those uncorrected misstatements do not at the end of the day surpass the materiality level of $50,000. So, because if you have $50,000 as your overall materiality level, that means this misstatement of 10,000 in this area, 12,000 in this area, you ignore them. But at the end of the day, when you add everything together, you find out that it has gotten to even 100. And it makes the whole financial statement um, misstated as a whole. So, we set this performance materiality for each area of the financial statement to ensure that 
when they aggregate all the misstatements in those areas, it does not surpass the overall materiality. So it helps the auditor. It's actually a new concept. So what we are saying is that with this performance materiality, it can help him to actually ensure that when all these little, little, little misstatements are aggregated together, they do not surpass the performance, um, the overall materiality. So look at this calculation. This calculation is usually done by the auditor at the um, review and finalization stage. One, all the uncorrected and unadjusted misstatements and error for the, for the year under review. That's the current year, the current year, all those errors, all those misstatements that are not corrected. As I told you, it's not all errors that will be corrected by the management. The management will definitely tell you, oh, these are not material, and or this is the way we do things. Or, you know, as long as the auditor does not see it as material, you can't force them to correct them. It's only the material ones that you insist that should be corrected. So now, during this review and finalization stage, you must make sure that all unadjusted misstatements, all uncorrected errors for that year, you must have the estimate. What is the estimate of such a figure? You need to have it. Then all unadjusted misstatements brought forward. So just like this year, that I told you that some errors will not be corrected or will not be, will not be, um, you will not force them to correct it for the year. They'll be unadjusted, they'll be uncorrected. Same as previous year. So you still have uncorrected misstatements or unadjusted misstatements from previous year. The auditor needs to also calculate those figures from previous years. That if at all you have any, he brings it into this table. Then after bringing it into this table, he needs to estimate based on his own materiality level and his detection risk, whether he can estimate the possible undetected misstatement. This is an estimate, please. The emphasis here is on estimate. He will estimate that from this review I've done, likely, if I'm not going to detect any misstatements, how much will it be? And for him to actually carry out this um, estimate, he must be able to say how high the inherent risk is, how high is the control risk for him to be able to determine that, okay, if we are to say by percentage, the misstatements that may not be detected by me, he needs to give an estimate to that. So once he gives an estimate to that, he comes up with a figure that is known as the aggregate uncorrected misstatement. The number one figure, that's uncorrected or adjusted misstatement from this year's audit, unadjusted misstatement from previous year's audit, last year's audit, two years ago's audit, he has to aggregate all of them. You put in an absolute figure. You also put in an absolute figure for the one for this year. He needs to get an estimate of all the possible undetected misstatements, bring it into here, and it comes up with a figure known as aggregate uncorrected misstatement. You see these aggregate uncorrected misstatements we are talking about? If this figure, this figure is more than the materiality level, then there's a problem. For instance, we've said that the mater we are assuming that the materiality level is 50,000. Imagine that this figure now is like 49,000. There's a problem. If this figure is like uh, maybe 10,000, then the auditor is actually okay because it's far, far less than the overall materiality. So what I'm telling you now, which I need you to understand is that calculating this aggregate uncorrected misstatements is to compare it with the overall original materiality. So this is it in your notes. I said, note that when you calculate aggregate uncorrected misstatements, only the net effect should be considered. This is the net effect here. That's you add this, add this, add this. You are considering this overall effect. Only the net effect should be considered. 
an auditor should compare this aggregate uncorrected misstatement as above to the original materiality level to determine the closeness. So you are the, you are you are taking we are, we are assuming that our materiality level is say um, fifty thousand, right? We are the, we are assuming that it's fifty thousand. So if it's fifty thousand and this figure is ten thousand, we are good to go. But if it's fifty thousand and this figure is say forty five thousand or say forty nine thousand or forty eight thousand, then there's a problem. That means that financial statement may be materially misstatement. So we are saying an auditor should compare the aggregate uncorrected misstatements and errors to the original materiality level. And the reason you are doing that is to determine their closeness. So if it is well below that level, the auditor should be less concerned and go ahead and finalize his report, probably give a clean report. But if it is close, then there is problem. Now, these are some scenarios I painted for you, three of them. So where the aggregate uncorrected misstatement is either above, equal, or very close to the materiality level, the auditor should do certain things. Now, we said the auditor should request the client's management to adjust or amend more of the identified misstatements, i.e. one and two. This is what I mean. If it's close, then you come here. You come here. If this is, say, 30,000 or 23,000, you come here and tell the client, please, all these uncorrected misstatements, we agree that they are not material. Please, adjust them. You agree they are not material, but you need to press on them to reduce it by adjusting as much as they, they can adjust. That's for one. Now, after you have succeeded in getting them to adjust this one, you come to two. Please, from previous years, you had some unadjusted misstatements that were brought forward from previous years. Kindly help us because of God and adjust more. Let's assume that that year it was 20,000. You can tell them, please, can you adjust it to 10? Or can you adjust it to 5? You know, so what the essence of asking them to adjust it is to push down this figure, to push down this 48, to this 23, and uh, so you are pushing it down to maybe 28. Or if your own assessment of the misstatements that may not have been captured during the year that you did not identify, the possible undetected misstatement, let's say they are at 30,000. You also need to, so from, hope we are all together and you can hear me and you understand me, please. Yes, sir. Yes. So we are saying that if you find out that this uncorrected misstatement is above, is above that 50,000, is equals to it or very close to it, we said the auditor should do certain things. He should request the client's management to adjust or amend more of the identified misstatements in the table, in the table above. That's one and two. So it must adjust this one and two. It's the adjustment of this one and two that I'm describing to you. So it must come here, ask them to adjust this one from say 23 now to 10,000, adjust this ones from previous years, say from 10,000 now, you should adjust it to five, then if you add everything together, you'll be getting like 40, you'll be getting 45,000. Yes. But even the 45 is still too close to this 50,000. Or now, let's even assume that the, the management refuses to reduce this 10,000. They refuse to reduce this 5,000. That's they refuse to adjust the ones from prior year they refuse to adjust the ones for this year, then I want to ask you, what do you think the auditor should do? You have begged them to adjust number one. You also beg them to adjust number two. What do you think the auditor should do? I need to hear you. What do you think the auditor should do? 
They refuse to adjust the ones from the year under review. They refuse to adjust the one from previous years. What can the auditor do? Yes, I'm listening. Just want to hear your, you know, I need you to think, you know, just think wide. You don't have to be correct, but your ability to attempt these questions, that means you are actually taxing your brain. And at the end of the day, you are you get the correct answer when we treat it together. So what do you think he should do? Now that is aggregate uncorrected misstatements are close to the materiality level, overall materiality level. And we said that what he needs to do is to tell the management to reduce these errors for previous years, reduce the ones for current years, so that we can bring down this figure. So now that they've decided not to do that, what will you do? Oh, yeah, attempt to. Attempt, uh, Asana. Don't laugh. Attempt. Abraham, please. Attempt. Okay. Who said Abraham should attempt? <laughs> yeah, give it a try now. You have begged them. Please correct more errors. We agree that they are not material, but please correct the ones for this year. Please correct the one for next, for previous years. So in this kind of situation, what do you do when they decide not to correct? What do you do? Anybody there? Contrary uh, opinion of the of the can auditors. You, please, Ayo, can you start afresh? I didn't get your initial remark. Yeah, I'm saying that since the management uh, maintain their positions that. They are not material. I think the the auditor should check the should repeat the procedure again to check and then maybe to re scrutinize the entire the document entire, they have. Okay, you should yeah. have one. Okay. Yes, and then if if at the end of the day it's still the same thing. Yes. And then what the should auditor auditing team are not uh, are not satisfied. I think. They should just it should just form part of their part of their opinion, and then you know they have to state it in their in their report. Okay, okay, that's that's a, that's actually a very very um, a very very good attempt. Um, as I have always said, I encourage us to try as much as possible to think outside the box because when you hook inside the exam hall. Is your ability to think outside the box that will rescue you. So Ayo is partially right. What we are saying is that should the auditors decide, uh, the management decide that they are not um, adjusting number one and number two, that means the auditor has to go and roll his sleeves and do more work to bring down this estimate undetected misstatement. Because now, you know, he's the one, he, 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 he's responsible for expressing the opinion. All these ones are not, and he has also estimated that uh, most likely from the work he has done, he thinks that about 30,000 worth of transactions may have been undetected by him. So if they've refused to reduce one and two, then he needs to perform more procedures with the aim of bringing down these estimates to probably 5,000 or to even zero, which is not possible, or to 4,000. 
So the the what we are saying now is that, for example, if the sample maybe selected a sample of um or his materiality level was fifty thousand, as we have mentioned here, that the materiality level is fifty thousand. But now that those guys have decided that they are not going to adjust that misstatement, what he will do now is to reduce this his materiality level to probably even 25. You know, if he reduces it to 25, that means he has to go and do more work. That means that all the transactions that were not captured based on his materiality level, he needs to revisit them. So he must go and do more work. So you see that he has to bring down this materiality to 25 and him bringing it to 25 means that he has to go back and do more work. He needs to perform more procedures. So um, from your notes here, I said the auditor should perform additional audit procedures to reduce three above, to reduce undetected misstatements. But what we said is that when they are close, when the materiality level is close to the aggregate uncorrected misstatement, you are to request management to adjust or amend more of this. But in case they cannot do that, or they've adjusted it and it's still close, then what the auditor needs to do is to perform additional audit procedures to reduce the level of undetected misstatements to a lower level because by reducing that it forces down the whole figure any question please and before your question we now say where the additional audit procedures are performed and the figure is still material the auditor should modify his report based on that's just in line with what i said you have tried to make them reduce one and two they've tried it's still hope you try to perform more more audits, more procedures to bring down number three. Number three has still not performed, has still not resulted in any significant changes. Then what you need to do is to modify the audit reports. You have to consider modifying the audit report. Any question? Any question? Okay, so if there are no questions, please note that I told you earlier that the, the audit engagement partner would um, make sure that he performs analytical procedures at the end. And you people are refusing to talk. Why is he performing that analytical procedure at the end? I want to hear. Why is he performing the analytical procedures at the end? because I've mentioned it in the course of this class, I need to know why he's performing those analytical procedures at the end, at this review and finalization stage. Yes, I'm with you. Because it's a requirement by the standard. Yes, so why do you think the standard is requiring that? Because yes, it's a requirement, but there's a reason. And I've mentioned it today. Okay. Maybe it's like a check. Okay. Like to check, verify if everything has been done properly. Okay, if everything has been done properly, okay. Okay, please note it down. The essence of performing analytical procedures during the review and finalization stage is for the engagement partner to um, compare the results he gets with his understanding of the entity, understanding of the industry. So if he compares them and they are consistent, then it's okay. But like Abraham said, to be sure that everything is okay. But if he now performs that analytical procedure during this review and finalization stage, and he sees that it is so, so far away from his understanding of the entity, understanding of the competitors, understanding of the industry, then it means that there's a problem with the work that has been done. 
That means that he may likely mandate his team members to go back and check um, what makes up a current asset. Is it not asset over what was the what's the formula for current asset? Is it asset over liability or something like that? Current assets. Yes. Current assets. Yes, what's the formula credit. for current asset? Formula for current asset. Yes, how do you what do you I don't know that. what are the variables when you want to when you want to perform when you want to calculate current asset now? You just add all the current assets. Uh -huh. As in maybe like the inventory. Yes. The receivables. Yes, you are correct. Then when, you, then when you add them together, you have the current asset. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, okay. Sorry. I mean current ratio. What's the formula for okay. current ratio? Current ratio. That current asset divided by current liability. Current asset. Okay. Divided by current liability. In time. Okay. Uh, do, you, do you know why they perform that, um, that calculation, that ratio? What's the essence? Has to know how many times the current assets will be able to handle the current liabilities. Okay. Be able to carry. The current liabilities. How how the entities uh, entities ability to pay its short term obligations? How the current assets can pay all the current liabilities? You are correct. So what I'm saying now is that if you now have a, a the the normal current assets, which the engagement partner is aware of which they performed at the risk assessment level, substantive level, was one is to two. That means the, the, probably the, the asset can cover the liability two times. Then at the finalization stage now, when they presented the financial statement to him, he performs this calculation again, then he's getting one is to four. I don't know if you get me. It's now getting one is to four. When normally it's supposed to be one is to two. In that industry, it's usually one is to two. That is to tell him that there is an error somewhere. So somebody will need to go and check all the current assets again. Someone needs to go and check all the current liabilities again. Because those are the two variables and they may actually be problems with one of those figures. So as the experienced man in the, in the house, what he will do is... Um, perform that ratio, when he sees that this variance is too much with his understanding, he will ask people to go and perform that um, audit again, or that particular area. Where does he, because for current assets over current liabilities, if he has a problem, what will you go and check? You go and check all the current assets again. Check your receivable, check your inventory, check your bank, check your cash, or check all those your um, payables and things like that. So that is how we use analytical procedure to detect errors, to detect areas that are not consistent with your general understanding of the financial statement. So that is why we said at this stage, at, we said, can you see my screen? Yes. yes, we said at this stage, it is expected that the auditor should know much about the client to be in a good position to identify and understand the reason for any variances. Hope you get it now. So it's only somebody that understands the client that will be able to use the analytical procedure. And if there's any significant variance, you'll be able to say, no, wait a minute. Why are we having this significant um, variance? This is not my understanding of the entity. Okay, so, um, so we said it is used at this stage to also identify any previously unidentified audit risk, which may cause the auditor to raise the level of associated risk. So we're going to leave that at that so that we don't overflog it. Now, another part of reviews that must be performed during finalization is checking other information published in the same document that contains the financial statement. This is nothing serious. If you have seen a set of um, audited reports before or financial statement, audited financial statement, all those booklets that you see that are shared during the AGM or sent to shareholders to have an understanding of what is going on in the entity, they will usually publish other information. 
like um like director's statement chairman's statement profile of the entity their projection five year projection and um, 10 years forecast you know there are always going to be other informations other information in that same document you have the financial statement inside but you are going to have other reports maybe report on corporate social responsibility reports from our chairman reports from the management team reports from you know different other reports but now it is the auditor's responsibility to ensure that all those other reports that are published alongside the financial statement are consistent with the financial statement these are those type of reports you will find director's statement director's report chairman's report five years summary employee data financial ratios corporate social responsibility so you find the financial statement in that same booklet and you still find all these kind of reports alongside but the standard is very clear in 720 that the auditor must review all these other reports or all these other information published alongside the financial statement. The essence of reviewing this is that you may likely find a situation whereby some of those other information are not credible. They are not credible. They are speaking, they are not consistent with the financial statement. Let me give you an example. The chairman in his statement is saying that by next year, the organization is going to manufacture a car that uses um, orange juice. The car uses orange juice and will be able to fly. Yes, the, the, the chairman may be very ambitious. That is his dream for the entity. But remember that anybody that is, going to, that is going to manufacture a car that uses orange juice and will be able to fly, then at least you must be able to see research and development. You must be able to see that that financial statement supports the fact that somebody is working towards a particular invention. So in a financial statement where they are not used to doing cars that fly, they are not used to doing cars that use uh, orange juice, but somebody is now telling us in the report now that they are going to produce these cars and you look at this financial statement you cannot find research and development cost which is usually that part of the financial statement that tries to capitalize all expenditures that relates to um uh, development and expense now. do you understand okay let me give you another example um the last year's financial statement shows a loss of one million dollars the one before the last shows a loss of two million. Three years, three years ago's financial statement shows a loss of three million dollars. Now, for this um, um, five-year financial summary, five years uh, financial highlight, or let me say a projection, five-year. projection now the, the the management are projecting that by next year they are going to be making a profit of 30 million dollars so please tell me how somebody that has made three years consecutive loss we all of a sudden come and publish inside the same uh, publish this information telling the shareholders that next year they're going to be having 30 million dollars does it make sense i want to hear you does it make any sense Yes, who is in the house? Does it make sense? Somebody is yes. making three years, three years financial loss, and now he's projecting that next year is going to be making thirty million dollars. Um, I you said it makes sense. Yes, exactly. Are you saying it makes sense or it does not? It makes sense. How does it make sense for you to be making yeah. three year loss? Then now you're projecting. Enough that you make a profit of $30 million. Just as you have explained, sir, the, yes. like now the company must have been, you know, very, okay, in the situation of uh, producing a car that uses uh, orange juice as fuel, and yeah. then that can also fly. The company must have been, you know, 
um, must have been making a lot of expenses, maybe in research costs and uh, development costs, which uh, okay. has pulled down the profit for the past two financial years. Two years. Okay. Yes. I get where you are. So by the time they start producing the vehicle, it's possible they have a, a sales uh, projection of that can really go up to that amount you specified. Okay. And definitely they will yes. have profits. Okay, they will have profit, but remember I said that in that financial statement, there is no research and development cost. Okay, so... So if there's possible. no research and development cost, so how do you want to, or is it a secret, uh, uh, secret Society. agenda? Exactly, secret agenda that somebody is making things that we don't even understand. So in essence, what I'm just saying is that um, all those other informations that will be published alongside the financial statement, the auditor is mandated by ISC 720 to review those information to ensure that it does is not inconsistent with the financial statement. Because what it means is that if those information are inconsistent, then you won't even know which one to trust. Is it what chairman has said or the financial statement? One of them will need to be wrong. And the auditor will try to ensure that that financial statement, the credibility of the financial statement, which is going to express an opinion on, is um, kept intact. So the objective is to ensure, as I said in your note, that ensure that these other financial and non-financial information do not undermine the credibility of the financial statement. So in a case like this, what the auditor needs to do first is to consider which of them is wrong. If he has done that and he discovers that there are material inconsistency between these documents, other information and the financial statement, one, the auditor must first determine whether it is the financial statement that needs amendment or the other information. So if it is the other information that need amendment or the financial statement, whichever one needs amendment, it needs to ask management to amend them. But should management refuse to amend this misstatement or correct those inconsistent, inconsistency, then he has no choice than to modify the financial report. You need to modify it. That's, he cannot tell you that it shows a true and fair view anymore. When actually um, um, the two the two informations are contradicting each other, and he has asked them to to correct them, and they refuse to correct them. So um, so when we get to audit report, we'll tell you the various sections in the audit report that can be used in modifying this um, modifying or drawing the attention of users of the financial statement to this. Um, um, okay, we said. You should modify the report if it is the financial statement. Modify the audit report if it is the financial statement that has the issue. However, if it is the other information that have the issue, then the auditor should discuss the matter with those charged with governance. You have to discuss with them. But if they delay or do not withdraw the issues of, or if they delay in arrange, um, in actually modifying this, in uh, correcting this information, then he has to delay or withhold the issuance of the audit report until when they are able to correct it. Because he has to express an opinion. And now there are other informations that are causing problem. He needs to make sure they do it. He has that delays issuance of the report until a time when it's reasonable enough for him to release it. And what I was preventing or trying not to go into was issue of this other matter paragraph, because I don't want to confuse you, but I will tell you when we now start audit report, why he has to modify his report using other matter paragraph. I won't go there now, but he can also seek advice or consider withdrawing, because that means this management don't even have integrity. Correct the other information they refuse. Correct the financial statement, they refuse. If they don't correct the financial statement, it's very easy for him to modify his report. But those other information, if they don't correct it, what will he do? He needs to seek legal advice and um, also try to 
consider whether it's possible for him to withdraw from the engagement. Now, let's move to, please raise your hand if you have any question. Well, I want us to quickly move to um, ISA 510. Any question, please? Any question? Okay, I believe there is no question. So this is another review that must be performed by the auditor. He has to make sure that he audits all the opening balances and disclosures. All opening balances and disclosures, especially if it is an initial engagement. Initial engagement where is the is performing the audit for the first time, or um, someone else performed the audit and those closing balances were not actually done by him. He needs to be sure that the closing balance for previous years, the closing balance for previous years have been correctly transferred to the current financial statement. Do you know that um, if you have errors in previous years or you, 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 there's an error in carrying forward all the closing balances, it will lead to a misstatement in the financial statement. Asset, asset that should have been $2 million, why lifting it to the current year's financial statement, you lifted $20 million. The ability that should be fifteen um, should be $150,000, why lifting it to this current year, you lifted it as $15,000. So those things can happen. So it is mandatory for the auditor to make sure that all the amounts and disclosures that were included in the last year's prior year's financial statement as closing balance have been properly carried forward. You see that audit is not easy. So as you are certifying this year's financial statement, you have to ensure that all those figures that form part of this year's financial statement that were carried forward from last year, you need to ensure that they were properly transferred. If you don't ensure that they were properly transferred or during review and finalization, you don't check to ensure that these figures have been properly transferred, then you are likely going to be having a misstated financial um, statement. So um, what the standard requires the auditor to do is to obtain sufficient and appropriate evidence on whether the opening balance contains misstatements that can materially affect the current year's financial statement. So that is that. It's very straightforward. The auditor's responsibility on the opening balances is very critical because if he does not make sure that those figures have been properly transferred, then that means even this current year's financial statement will be misstated. So that is that for that area. Um, just have it in mind. When we get to um, our audit report, I would, I would elaborate more on issues where opening balances and closing and disclosures have not been properly carried forward. What it needs to do, either issues except for or issues adverse opinion. So we'll go into that. But these are the relevant procedures that must be performed by the auditor. One is that he needs to inquire from the, the preparer of the financial statement. Hold up, please. OK, so what I'm saying is that these are some of the procedures he needs to ask the preparer, um, in this case, probably the finance director, he needs to ask from them on the policies and procedures of transferring disclosing balances and disclosures to a new period. He also needs to review that um, last year's account to physically see that they've been properly um, transferred, including the consistency. You know, it has to be round peg inside a uh, round hole, square peg inside a square hole. So um, for that reason, you must confirm the consistency of accounting policy used for the current year and the prior year. What we mean is that 
hope is the same policy that was used last year that is used this year. Because if those policies are not correct, if those policies are not consistent, uh, that means you'll be comparing Agba Lumo with Orange or comparing Apple with uh, uh, Agba Lumo. So you have to be comparing policies for the prior year to the ones for this year. There has to be consistency. And if there's any cons inconsistency in the use of policies for the prior year and this year, it must be in line with a particular standard. Who can remind me of that standard? What standard would... This is... IS what? 40. Sorry, uh, IFRS 16, sorry. Eight. 16. Eight. Eight, okay, policies. Yes. Okay, Change yeah. in accounting it's, policies, it's, sorry, estimates yes. and error. So you must make sure, you must review all the disclosures made to ensure that any change in accounting policy has been properly disclosed and done in line with IES 8. So the work of the engagement partner is not as easy as it may seem. He has to carry out this overall review of the financial statement. Obtain written representation from the client management, you can see now, on, on the opening balances and comparative information and so forth and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's move to ISA 710, comparative information. Um, give me a second, please. Okay, Asana, any issue? Sir. You have a question? Okay, it's like your network is having issues. Um, but why not make use of the chat? I'm not even been able to call. Oh. I don't even know to Okay, I can barely hear you. Yes. What? Me too. Okay, you're having issues, right? Yes, of network. Now don't tell worry. Me to in okay, no, don't worry. Just try to hang on there. Um, but yes. what I'll do is that I will share the link of the video okay. so that you can uh, refer back to it. Or you need to hang on okay, because sir. you need to contribute to yes. the team. Yes, yes, sir. So a question for everybody in the house. I asked this question the last time, and I think it was only Ayo that was able to um, satisfy me. Who has seen audited financial reports before? Who has seen that booklet, that audited financial report? If you have seen it, I need to please signify. Who has seen audited financial report before? I've seen it. Okay. Um, Abraham has seen it. Asana, have you seen? No, sir. How about Peter or Ujima? Yes, sir. Oh, Peter, you've seen it? I've, I've seen. Okay, Ujima has seen it. Okay, so, yeah. but you know that this document is always a bit bulky, right? Yes. Okay, so this same um, report, at times when we are preparing the financial um, statement or the financial report, there are going to be corresponding information. What I mean by corresponding information is that you are likely to see these year's figures and last year's figures, they'll compare the two. There are some that you may see, they will even compare it with five years figures. They'll put this year's figures Put last year, 2019, um, 2018, put 2017, put 2016. They try to put them side by side. Um, let me show you something. Um, I'm trying to just hang on there. Okay, can you see the whiteboard?
Can you see this? Start. Can you see this board? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. Let me say non current assets. So, what do we have in non current assets? Property, plant, and equipment. Yes. What else do we have in uh, non current assets? Yeah, I help you. What else? What other items do we have in non current assets? Okay. Goodwill. Okay. Thank you. Investment. Yes. So let's say this is um, PPE. Then we have a uh, investment uh, goodwill. Goodwill. Then um, I also said we have investment. Investment. Now. Usually, you have something like this. Uh, let's say 2019. Then you have uh, 20, 2018. Okay, so this is supposed to be 19. Let me take this off. And this is supposed to be... Okay, so let me just, um, let me, sorry, I'm trying to show you, a, I'm trying to show you something. Okay, let me just change this to, okay, so sorry. let me use that as, yes. I'm with you, Ewa. No, I was just suggesting that maybe if you use Excel. Oh, okay. Um, in fact, that Excel eh, for show me plenty paper. Let me just use this one now. Okay. Yeah. Let me say 2000. Let me say just to illustrate. So what I'm saying is that normally, you know, please just take it like this. Normally, what you see is that when you have um when you have um, those corresponding figures, as they always show in um, in the financial statement, you have different, different, uh, see what I'm doing. Here. <laughs> okay, so let me just undo. So assume that this, this 2019 I'm showing you is 2018. So you have the figures for 2019, you have the ones for 2018 in the same, um, in the same box in the same area, in the same page, you, they, are they, they, are, they are showing them together. And if it is the one that you have for five different years, that means you have 2019, you have 2018, you have 2016, you have 2017, you have all of them together. So as you have PPE 1000 for 2018, you might have the corresponding one for 2019. The, the figure will be there. If you have um, Goodwill 2000 for 2019, for the corresponding figure, you see maybe uh, 1,005. So I'm using this blackboard for the first time. That's why I'm having challenges um, using it. And the blackboard, that means I would have just gone to Excel, you know, put in those figures, then share my screen. But all I'm just trying to say, or probably I could still go there. Let me go to Excel. As suggested by UI. Can, can you see my page now? Who can see this? Nothing. You can't see anything. Just the, the whiteboard. Oh, the whiteboard is still what is showing. Um, okay, let me share it again.
Okay, can you see the Excel now? Yes. Okay, thank you. So usually you see 2018, you see here 2019, then um, let's, let's kind of bold in this, bold in this, then you can have here receivable, receivable, you can have here cash, you can have here bank, you can have here inventory. So now you can have figures here like 1,000. Here you have 800. Here you have 1,500. Here you have uh, 1,200. Here maybe 2,000. Here 2,500. So what I'm trying to tell you in essence is that most financial um, reports, we have two figures side by side with each other so that you can actually um, kind of see the, the, the difference or the variance of what happened this year against what happened last year. So that is um, basically what I'm trying to show you. So let me go back to the notes and um, okay. So we said um, comparative information is amounts and disclosures of entities covering one or more reporting periods or regarding preceding year and present year's financial statement, just like what I showed you. So what 710 is saying is that the auditor needs to obtain sufficient and appropriate evidence on whether this corresponding informations have been presented properly. There are two types. We have corresponding figures and comparative figures. The corresponding figure are usually the ones where you have um, the current year's financial statement put in side by side with the preceding year. The preceding year's financial figures are included as part of the year's financial statement side by side. So you have 2017 now reported, and you also have that same page showing you 2018, just like I tried to show you. But if it's comparative financial statements now, this one, this one I just mentioned is corresponding figures. You have them side by side, just like I showed you in the Excel. But for this one, you have it in the same report, but it's not on the same page. So what it means is that why you have the one for the current year in page 20, you are likely to have other years financial or preceding years financial information in a different page, maybe page 30 or page 40. But what we are saying is that these informations will be inside that financial report um, side by side or they shall be in that same report. So the auditor needs to make sure that they are consistent. He needs to obtain information on whether the accounting policies used for that comparative year is the one used for the current year. So, because you have to like us to go with like. You can't, you can't use another policy to put a figure when the current year's figure was done using another policy. And if it has to be changed, it must be done in line with IAS 8. So, these are the scenarios. Um, the, the preceding year's audit reports Okay, so you need to read all this. So I don't want to bug you with that. Those are just scenarios for you to have a good understanding of um, this topic. But since we have about 15 minutes more, let's just look at it. If you find um, what will be the impact on the audit report where the preceding year's audit report was modified and the issue that led to the modification of that previous year's audit report has not been corrected. I think I'm going to leave this area. Why I'm leaving it, someone, can someone guess why I don't want to talk about this area? Can someone guess why I don't want to talk about this particular scenarios? This issue of um, the impact on the financial reports. Yes? 
why do you think I don't want to say anything about this impact on the financial reports? Who is reading my mind? Who is reading my mind? Why don't I want to go into this? Okay. Since nobody can answer that question, yes, the reason I don't want to go into this is because next class we are going to be treating audit report. So until you understand the concept behind the audit report, you may find it difficult to understand when I say you should modify or you should unmodify, or probably you should use emphasis of matter paragraph, or when I start telling you to use adverse opinion, or when I start telling you to use other matter paragraph, you might get confused. So I'm giving you an assignment. Please, next class, once we are able to conclude audit report, kindly refer me back to the last part of this note. That's starting from here possible scenarios and their impact on the financial reports. By then you would have understood the concept behind financial report, ISA 700, 701, 706, 705, then we can come back and address this scenario. Because if you don't understand what the financial report is really all about, you may find it difficult to understand what we are saying here. So any question before we call it a day? Any question? Question, question, question. If you don't have any question, please signify and tell me you don't have any question so that I can end the class. Ujima, do you have a question? No, sir. Okay. Um, so please, for those of you that had challenges with your internet, I'm going to be sharing the link to this um, to this lecture, I'm going to be sharing the link to this lecture so that you can um, I'll be sharing the link to this lecture so that if you didn't get it, you can actually follow up and um, go over it again. But please, next class is very important. We are going to be starting with audit report, and audit report will be tested. And when we start solving questions, you will see that we'll be coming across audit report in almost every class we, we try to solve. We're going to be coming across audit report. So can I end the class now since you don't have a question? Okay, do you have a question, Esther, Susan, Peter, Ayo, Abraham? No, oh, sir. Okay, so let's no, sir. Yes, no, so sir. let's meet on uh, Friday. Please go back to the link. Ayo has a question. He said, please, can you help us with list of possible ISAs for this subject? I mean, AA. Okay, Ayo, I would, um, I'll send that to the group chat. I'll send that to the group chat. And um, so, but for the ISAs, okay, I'll send that to you. But at your level, you may not be required to actually go and start reading those ISAs in total. What you need to pass this exam is what I've tried to extract for you. But it's very important that if you have that um, confidence and that ability to go through these ISAs, it will be a plus to you. It can never be a minus. You actually understand um what what um, those standards are talking about okay so thank you and i'll uh, see you on saturday please make it a date